Imagine present-day Andorra coming to head an empire that covers the whole of Western Europe in the next couple of centuries. This may or may not sound ludicrous, however history has proven that such instances are not only possible, but are in fact quite common as well. Many well-known and influential countries today have a very humble origin, so it would be interesting if we explore a couple of such stories. This video will cover the history of multiple nations at once, so I would be forced to generalize a lot throughout it. But before going any further, I'd like to give my special thanks to my patrons who so generously support my content. Your help is much appreciated and helps me stay motivated to upload consistently. Now back to the video. Great Britain, only a century ago its empire ruled over one quarter of the world's entire land area. The progenitor of the UK, England, has a very long and complicated history, and the origins of its kingdom are equally confusing, mysterious and very humble as well. Our story begins in the 5th century, after Roman control on the island of Britain was now just a memory. Having raided the British coast for centuries, the Germanic tribes of the Angles, Jutes and Saxons would invade and settle the island permanently. This migration was a long and complicated process that is also shrouded in mystery because the first written sources about this period only appear in the following 6th century. Exactly how these foreign tribes ended up in Britain is also unclear, theories range a lot. One of the most popular ones is that they were Federati mercenaries who eventually successfully rebelled against their employers, the native Romano Britons. This was then followed by migrations of more and more Anglo-Saxon peoples. During the beginning of the early 500s, a chieftain named Kedrick and his son Kinrick would conquer the region of Hampshire after fighting numerous wars with the local Romano Britons. These characters' origins and existence are much debated. However, still historians have agreed that it is pretty likely that these chieftains were actual figures. Kedrick's annexation of the region is believed to be the foundation of the Kingdom of Wessex, the polity that would eventually create England. However, in the early 6th and 7th centuries, Wessex was far from being the most powerful of the newly established kingdoms on the island. At the time, England was a patchwork of numerous Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, however in time a couple of states would come to dominate the region. At first, the southeastern kingdom of Kent managed to solidify itself as the strongest in the late 6th century. That would not last for long and, in time, the middle kingdom of Mercia and the newly unified Northumbria would dominate the rest of the Saxon kingdoms and constantly vie for dominance. Eventually, Mercia would come on top, with it becoming the hegemon on the island in the 700s. Headed by the competent kings, Ethelbold and Offa, the Mercians would end up exercising control over the southern Saxon kingdoms as well. Although retaining most of its independence, Wessex was also under a partial Mercian rule. That would change in the early 9th century, when the balance of power would shift drastically towards the site of the West Saxons. Ascending on the throne of Wessex in 802, King Egbert would challenge the weakened Mercians. In 825 he would crush his northern neighbours at the Battle of Ellendon, and four years later would even conquer and rule Mercia for one year. On top of all these successes, Egbert also led other successful campaigns, putting nearly everything south of the river Thames under his rule. Egbert was also successful in battling another enemy, the Vikings. Ever since the year 793, Norse pagan raiders had been plundering the coasts of Britain with impunity. However, between the years 860 and 70, they would come to the island to stay. Two big armies of Vikings would eventually conquer all of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, with the exception of one. Wessex was now under the rule of Egbert's grandson, Alfred. The Vikings were quick to attack his holdings and the young king was forced to escape to the marshy areas of the south. Regrouping his armies and strength, Alfred was able to face and decisively defeat the Viking chieftain Guthrum at the famous Battle of Eddington in 878. In the process, Alfred would go on the offensive and in 879 a clear border would be established between the area ruled by the Norse and the area ruled by the Saxons. The whole eastern half of what was once the Kingdom of Mercia would be recaptured from the Vikings and reorganized into a vassal of Wessex. 
Ten years of peace would follow during which King Alfred would improve the defenses of Wessex by establishing the famous Burrs, a series of fortified towns. In the 890s, after another successful war with the Norse, Alfred would die and be succeeded by his son, Edward. The new king would begin a series of conquests that would lead to the rise of England in the year 927, but that would only happen under the rule of Edward's son, Atostan. Next on our list is Turkey. Now a regional power and home of over 70 million people, this country actually began from a single village in western Anatolia. The story of Turkey begins during the late 11th century, when the weakened Eastern Roman Empire lost its old heartland, the peninsula of Anatolia. The new masters of the region, a Turkic Muslim group called the Seljuks, had just finished conquering almost the entirety of the Middle East. For the first couple of centuries of their existence, the Anatolian Turks would be somewhat united under the rule of the Sultanate of Rum. Rum coming from a corrupted translation of Rome, not from Jack Sparrow's favorite drink, as much as that disappoints me. Anyway, the arrival of the Mongols in the 13th century would negatively affect the Sultanate which would eventually lead to its fragmentation in the early 14th century. Luckily for the numerous small Turkish principalities that emerged from this fragmentation, no serious outside threat was present at the time. Eastern Rome was still recovering from the Fourth Crusade while the Mongols were suffering from their own dilemma of internal division. In the meantime, nested near the heart of the severely contracted Byzantine possessions in Anatolia, the village of Sugut had become a safe haven for the Turkic warriors who wanted to escape Mongol hegemony. The place was headed by a man named Osman, who had just become the master or bey of the town after a short succession struggle with his uncle. Using his freshly recruited Turkic warriors, Osman would gradually capitalize on the Byzantine weakness to expand his territory. By the end of his reign in the 1320s, Osman's possessions would stretch from the Marmara to the Black Sea coast. Osman's son and successor, Orhan, would eventually conquer the last Byzantine lands in Asia Minor and the very strategically important Gallipoli Peninsula. The latter half of the 14th century would be marked by aggressive Ottoman expansion. This was especially the case during the reign of Sultan Bayezid the Lightning. His nickname matched his speed of conquest and by the early 1400s the Ottoman Beylik was already 50 times larger than it was only a hundred years ago. A century and a half later, the Turks would have established an empire stretching on three continents. A superpower that would dominate the area for the next four centuries, when it eventually collapsed following World War I, only to clear way to the modern Republic of Turkey. Spain is a country that has gone through a lot in its history. During the early modern period, the Spanish Empire ruled over one of the largest colonial empires to ever exist. As everyone who has heard of the Reconquista knows, this influential country actually has a very humble origin. During the early 8th century, an army of Arabs and Berbers incorporated the rapidly declining Visigothic Kingdom into the Umayyad Caliphate. In the very north of the Iberian Peninsula lay a region that was torn in the foot of every power that had previously attempted to rule the area. Protected by the Pyrenees mountain, the land of Asturias proved to be nearly impregnable. The Arabs probably did achieve some kind of nominal control over the region during the early stages of their conquest, however, not long after, a Visigothic nobleman of questionable background named Pelagius managed to gather enough support to rebel. In either 718 or 722, Pelagio, as he was called in his native language, defeated a Muslim raiding party at the Battle of Covadonga. Although obscure and not that significant, this battle helped Pelagius garnish his reputation enough to be recognized as the ruler of Asturias by the local noblemen. The kingdom will continue expanding throughout the 8th century, eventually reaching Galicia to the northwest. Under the rule of Alfonso II, Asturias would be solidified and even receive recognition from Charlemagne himself. In the late 9th century to early 10th century, the kingdom would expand a lot under the rule of Alfonso III. Now, the backwater principality of Asturias looked more like a proper European kingdom. Following multiple transformations and the fragmentation of Islamic rule in Iberia, the successor kingdoms of Asturias would eventually give rise to modern Spain by the 15th century. This concludes our list, special thanks to my patrons and to all who stayed till the end. That was all from me, and I'll see you in the next one.